There was once a rare moment on Earth when the sea offered refuge, while land became a scene of constant danger. Creatures on land struggled against brutal predators and harsh environments, yet the ocean felt calm by comparison. Today, we travel back to that strange chapter in Earth's past and explore how the waters turned into a safer home than the troubled land. Long before our familiar continents and oceans took shape, Earth went through times that would seem almost alien to us. Vast swamps covered regions that later transformed into deserts, and what we call continents looked nothing like modern maps. Huge land masses connected in one place, while some scattered islands broke the monotony of endless seas, temperatures in certain periods soared, and oxygen levels sometimes rose higher than what we see today. In other eras, extreme cold might grip large sections of the planet, but in the specific time we are exploring, the land turned into a nightmare. Fossils from these ancient epochs reveal that certain periods were filled with ferocious life forms on land. Giant amphibians might lurk around riverbanks, and land-dwelling reptiles grew both numerous and terrifying. Meanwhile, the oceans held creatures that appeared strange by modern standards. Some were massive, others had bizarre body shapes, but many were less deadly than their land counterparts of that time. This imbalance lets the ocean become a refuge. Early geology played a big role in shaping the environment. When supercontinents existed, weather patterns could be unstable. Some places became super dry, turning into giant deserts, while coastal zones might see floods or storms. Landscapes changed faster than one might expect, forcing animals to adapt or die. Because of these shifts, competition on land soared. Predators roamed across wide territories, and prey animals had little escape from stronger foes. Scientists who study ancient rocks and sediment layers observe how Earth's crust shifted over countless ages. Volcanoes erupted, mountains rose, and shallow inland seas appeared. Over centuries, dryness might drive animals closer to shrinking lakes or muddy waterholes on land, places that became battlegrounds for predators. In many periods, stepping near water was a risk because hungry creatures waited for a meal. Yet, in this special interval, the land's threats grew larger and more aggressive, pushing some life toward the sea for safety. The Earth's changing climate added to the land's hostility. Heat waves scorched wide expanses, and scarce water sources forced animals into deadly competition. Only those able to hide, fight, or flee stood a chance. Meanwhile, creatures in the sea faced less of this direct conflict. Some found niches in coral reefs or open waters, avoiding the chaotic battles happening above the surface. Thus, as the planet kept reshaping itself, a unique situation arose. The water stayed relatively calm, while the land turned vicious. Life on land often brings images of green forests and warm sunshine, but in this remote era, danger overshadowed everything else. Huge reptiles prowled the ground using claws and teeth to dominate smaller animals. Some amphibians reach sizes we might associate with large crocodiles, capable of ambushing creatures at watering holes. Instead of safe woodlands, the world above water sometimes looked like a battlefield where survival was a near miracle. Fierce competition reigned among carnivores. Each one aimed to claim territory, pushing weaker species aside. Hardly any day passed without a battle or a hunt, as these animals needed constant feeding. Fossil findings show skeletons with scars from bites and broken bones that partially healed, indicating animals survived repeated attacks. That kind of healing points to a life where violence was frequent and injuries were common. Climatic factors only made things worse. Heat waves or long dry spells forced groups of animals into smaller green zones, leading to intense fights over basic needs like water. In some parts of the world, giant dust storms might swirl, cutting off travel routes and trapping creatures. Smaller herbivores, desperate for water or fresh plants, became easy targets for predators. Even the bigger plant eaters faced the risk of predators teaming up or attacking them while they were at low water spots. Volcanic activity also shaped land conditions. Ash falls could smother vegetation and change local climates, leaving hungry animals to roam further than usual. With fewer feeding grounds, rivalry deepened. Some predators might have expanded their diets, hunting creatures they once ignored, spreading fear in every corner. Fossils show some unusual bites that suggest big carnivores attacked anything they could overpower, from younger members of their species to once untouched prey. Add to this the presence of endless travel by roaming packs or solitary hunters. Some roamed across massive distances in search of their next meal. For smaller animals or less agile creatures, the threat felt constant. No place on land was truly safe, as you never knew when a lethal opponent would appear. Despite the usual assumption that oceans hold the scariest of Earth's monsters, in this unusual era, the sea was not as fearsome. 
Marine animals had their share of threats. Some fish had sharp teeth, and marine reptiles could be large, but they did not match the brutal intensity of land predators. The competition under the waves tended to focus more on specialized feeding, avoiding direct high-stakes conflicts. Many sea creatures found ways to escape rather than fight. Schools of fish darted away from bigger pursuers, and shelled animals sought refuge in reefs or ocean floors. Environmental stability beneath the surface also reduced extremes. Water temperatures changed less drastically from day to night, helping marine life maintain steady metabolic rates. Ocean currents and waves dispersed resources more evenly, so few creatures needed to fight tooth and nail for territory each day. Predators like early sharks or large amphibious reptiles still existed, but these beasts seldom created the same kill or be killed environment that was so common above. They hunted to eat but did not actively engage in endless territorial battles. Fossil evidence tells us that marine diversity, while not always enormous, included many calm filter feeders and peaceful grazers. Some animals lived in thick reefs, nibbling on algae or plankton. Some cut along the seabed, scavenging leftover scraps. Others floated at mid-level depths, too quick for larger hunters to catch. This variety of peaceful lifestyles stands in sharp contrast to the land's constant strife for dominance. Even the biggest marine reptiles or fish in that period were not unstoppable juggernauts. They often had limited feeding niches, focusing on crustaceans or smaller fish. And though some paleontologists highlight a few very large carnivorous marine animals, their presence still did not rival the daily horrors that land creatures experienced. The marine food web might revolve around stealth or speed rather than savage conflict. Occasional deadly events did happen in the oceans, mass strandings or local extinctions, but these were less connected to violent attacks and more often related to shifts in temperature or salinity. Some marine mass graves contain fish or mollusks that died from sudden water changes, not from predators. Meanwhile on land, nearly every mass burial site seems to reveal bites, breaks, or warlike injuries. Because of this difference in daily survival, many animals that had the choice, especially semi-aquatic species, spent more time in or near the water. For them, the calmer waters offered an escape from the fierce competition on land. They might hunt or feed in shallow seas, returning to land only when necessary. In a sense, the ocean functioned like a safe harbor, a place to breathe easier when the land's chaos grew too intense. Beyond the animals themselves, the Earth's crust and climate played a big role in shaping these conditions. Tectonic plates moved steadily, forming supercontinents like Pangaea or Gondwana at various times. When large continents formed, vast desert regions appeared in their interiors because moisture from oceans couldn't easily reach those areas. In the corners or along coasts, climates changed abruptly from monsoonal storms to intense dryness, throwing animals into cycles of feast or famine. Volcanic activity also reared its head, spewing ash or sulfur into the atmosphere. These elements could block sunlight, cooling some areas, while greenhouse gases caused by the same eruptions warmed others in the long run. The result was a patchwork of different climates on land that forced animals to migrate or compete for the last green patches of forest or wetlands. As conditions fluctuated, predators got drawn into even tighter conflicts with one another and with prey. In contrast, the ocean's water mass acted as a buffer for climate extremes. While changing sea levels or undersea volcanic events could still impact marine life, the effects were often more gradual. Circulating currents spread nutrients over large distances, giving rise to stable pockets of life. Oceanic habitats offered animals places to hide or adapt without the daily violence seen on the land. Even large storms or tidal shifts rarely matched the constant risk land dwellers faced from each other. Sediment layers from this period reveal calm, layered deposits in many marine basins, hinting that life under the waves remained fairly consistent for periods. On land, by contrast, flood layers alternate with windblown sands and volcanic ash, painting a picture of sudden disruptions. Some paleontologists compare these layers to reading a chaotic story where each chapter involves another disaster or fight, while the sea's chapters are more measured. Another climatic factor was the oxygen content in the atmosphere, which could shift widely. Higher oxygen levels often let land animals grow larger and more active, raising the stakes in predator-prey interactions. But in marine settings, the dissolved oxygen levels also mattered, yet the ocean's vastness usually cushioned changes. Animals there could migrate to deeper or shallower zones, reducing direct conflict. Marine animals developed a wide range of adaptations that kept them away from trouble. Some of these features look simple now, yet in that era, they were key to survival. 
Filter feeders, for instance, glided in open water, capturing plankton with little confrontation. Others used camouflage, matching reef colors, or sandy floors so they could rest safely, hidden from roving predators. Many fish form schools, a defense strategy that lowers individual risk. If a predator attacked a group, the swirling mass of fish could confuse the hunter, giving each fish a higher chance of escape. Meanwhile, bottom dwellers like sea cucumbers or starfish avoided drama entirely by sifting through sediment, minding their own business. These animals never needed to evolve giant teeth or slicing claws because they found peaceful ways to eat and stay out of the spotlight. Some marine reptiles, akin to modern sea turtles, lived by munching on shellfish or sea plants. They lacked any urge to compete viciously with each other because their food sources were often plentiful. By staying near coastlines or shallow waters, they avoided the bigger open sea threats. Their slow but steady approach to life worked well in an environment that was not riddled with constant high-level aggression. Others developed advanced senses to detect danger early. Some early fish had lateral lines to sense vibrations. Certain cephalopods used color-changing skin to blend with reefs, tricking watchers into missing them altogether. These calm strategies stood out against the wild tactics on land, where everything seemed to revolve around speed, muscle, and raw aggression. Even the few fearsome marine animals were typically content with direct hunts that ended quickly. They had no reason to destroy entire areas or battle each other day after day over territories. The ocean's size also scattered the population, preventing tight, intense standoffs. For instance, a large predator might search for prey over a huge stretch of sea, rarely running into an equal rival. Fights happened, but they were quick and usually ended as soon as the predator got its meal. These ways of living created an ocean that, while not free of danger, was safer than the land. No giant armies of scaled killers, no monstrous packs that roamed day and night, just an ebb and flow of small skirmishes, ambushes, and mild contests for resources. For an era, the sea had a gentler approach to survival, letting its denizens focus on feeding and reproducing without living every moment in fear of catastrophic battles. Over time, the land grew more hostile as new species appeared and older species adapted. Plants spread widely, creating thick forests in some areas, but those forests held large predators that could hide and ambush prey. Some reptiles evolved stronger jaws or better armor, making them unstoppable to smaller animals. In certain epochs, huge herbivores developed formidable defenses, like horns or clubbed tails, fueling an arms race with carnivores. Climate fluctuations deepened these problems. Periods of extreme dryness pushed animals together around fewer water sources, leading to heightened conflict. Meanwhile, other periods of heavy rain might produce lush but short-lived feeding grounds, which also cause animals to gather in large numbers. This crowding set the stage for intense fights among herbivores or for ravenous predators to find easy pickings. As land predators improved, they became more specialized. Some hunted in packs, coordinating attacks. Others grew bigger and stronger, crushing bones with a single bite. A few developed cunning tactics, stalking from cover or luring victims into narrow spaces. These changes happened over generations, building up an environment where few land creatures felt safe. Fossils show repeated injuries, from deep tooth marks to limbs that healed awkwardly, proof of routine conflict. At the same time, some once gentle plant eaters got large enough to stand their ground, leading to violent battles for survival. Their bones sometimes appear with embedded teeth or broken horns. Scenes from fossil sites reveal entire mud pits filled with bones from multiple species that fought, died, and got buried together. As these trends continued, the difference between land and water grew stark. In seas, the basic formula of swift school Cooling fish, hidden reef dwellers, and mid-sized predators stayed stable. Under the waves, mass die-offs often stemmed from temperature or chemical changes, not relentless warfare. On land, though, each new wave of evolution introduced fresh ways to kill or defend. The world above water turned into a patchwork of deadly hotspots with apex predators ruling each territory. In effect, land became a place where each day you faced the possibility of crossing paths with a monstrous foe. The ocean, in contrast, remained a series of calmer ecosystems, bound by simpler predator-prey relationships and fewer arms races. Animals that could venture between the two might have found sweet relief in the waves, escaping the heat and claws that plagued those bound to the land. Looking back at this strange time, 
we see that water was safer for a few key reasons. First, land underwent constant turmoil due to climate shifts, battles for resources, and the rapid evolution of savage predators. Sea creatures by comparison lived in environments with less immediate strife. Even if big fish or marine reptiles existed, they tended to spread out and focus on quick hunts, not endless territorial feuds. Second, the vastness of the ocean offered more escape routes. If a predator appeared, schooling fish could scatter, reef dwellers could hide, and shell-bearing animals could lock down their bodies. In contrast, a small herbivore on land could face a dead end, stuck against rock faces or in narrow valleys. Meanwhile, top land predators gained more tools, bigger jaws, lethal claws, or brute strength to corner prey. Marine predators rarely had to evolve such extreme methods because chasing prey in water demanded agility over raw, crushing power. Third, the geology of the planet meant that supercontinents caused large, harsh inland areas with limited resources and water holes. This forced land animals into fierce competition whenever they met. The ocean, on the other hand, maintained stable temperatures and distributed resources more evenly. Even big storms at sea or shifting currents rarely produced the kind of lethal environment that daily hunts on land did. Fourth, in certain intervals, land animals faced not only each other, but also toxic air from volcanic eruptions or scorching heat from climate changes. Seas could buffer these effects to some extent, allowing marine life to adapt more gradually. Many aquatic species survived mild temperature swings that would devastate land ecosystems. This difference in strength made the sea a calmer refuge while the land reeled from massive climate events. Finally, evolutionary pressures in the ocean favored coexistence in many niches rather than an all-out war for territory. The complexity of reefs and underwater habitats spread out the competition. Only the biggest apex predators, like certain ancient sharks or marine reptiles, attempted direct hunts, and they usually did not wage continuous battles. In short, fewer reasons existed under the waves to spark large-scale violence. So, for that limited stretch in Earth's prehistory, stepping onto land exposed an animal to endless risk while swimming in the sea carried relatively smaller hazards. It is an unusual twist, given that we usually associate the oceans with massive sharks or sea monsters. Yet the fossil record and geological evidence point to a calmer underwater world compared to the savage conditions above. Earth's history is full of surprises, like the moment when land became far more lethal than the sea. Intense predators, fierce battles, and harsh climates turned the ground into a war zone, making the waters a safer bet for survival. Does this surprising chapter change how you view our planet's prehistoric past? Share your thoughts below. If this dive into Earth's strangest era excited you, please like, comment, and subscribe for more adventures through deep time. Thank you for joining us, and make sure to catch our next video shown on screen.